Welcome to Bunny Hugs and Mental Health, the podcast that deals with all things mental health. We talk to professionals, survivors, and loved ones about their sometimes informative, sometimes uplifting, and sometimes tragic stories. I'm your host of the show, Todd Rennebaum, advocate, recovering addict, experienced sufferer of depression and anxiety, and author of the children's book, Sometimes Daddy Cries. Hello, I'm Todd Rennebaum. Welcome to another episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health on the Saskatchewan Podcast Network. Go to saskpodcastnetwork.com and find all the wonderful, well not all of them, but a bunch of wonderful uh, podcasts made right here in Saskatchewan. Uh, another great website is pennyu.ca. Uh, that's Penny University Bookstore's website. Uh, it is a bookstore in Regina, 13th Avenue. 3104 13th Avenue, in fact, uh, and their website, pennyu.ca. You can find uh, all the books there that you can order, or you can go to their location on 13th Avenue there. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you if this is your first time, or if you've been listening from the very beginning. Thank you so much for listening. I'm very passionate about this podcast, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this episode. I am speaking to a young lady. Uh, her name is Megan Zong. She is an actress, playwright, uh, and and I think she's a singer too, uh, from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Uh, I, I I'm good friends with her. I, I used to work at Globe Theater, and so I met her through there. Uh, and I, I, I follow her on Facebook. And one day I see that she has a, a play that she's performing. Uh, it's called Unmasked. And it was being performed at La Troupe du Jour in Saskatoon. Uh, it's it's a place she wrote about her challenges and struggles she's had with psychosis. I saw that and I thought, what a wonderful episode. So I, I actually met her face to face in Saskatoon. And I was going to interview, I was going to watch the show and then interview her afterwards. Uh, unfortunately... Uh, the show, well, unfortunate for me, the show was sold out. Actually, the whole run was sold out, so she did really, really well. I was very, very proud of her. Uh, but unfortunately, I, I wasn't able to to watch the show, so I actually went to the theater, interviewed her just before that night's performance. So thank you, Megan, for that. Yeah, she it's an interesting story. I didn't know a whole lot about a psychosis uh, until that night. So yeah, thank you, Megan, for, for teaching me and for, for uh, you know, being so vulnerable. Anywho, all right. With that being said, I give to you Megan Zong. Okay, so the show is Unmasked. Yes. And it's about having psychosis? Yeah, it's about a, the central character named Meg, who's essentially myself, <laughs> um, is living <laughs> through psychosis. Um, and so she's having a hard time discerning reality from non reality. And how is that much like your own story? Yeah, so I would say about like 80 to 85% of the play is autobiographical, pulled straight from my own experience with psychosis back in 2014. Okay. Um, and the, the remaining chunk, like 20% or 25% is um, uh, fictionalized. Okay. Um, yeah. When did you first realize or Oh God, I'm so much better when I have questions prepared. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. When did you first realize that there was maybe you had mental health issues? Or? Yeah, um, so it started back in 2014, and um, it actually happened when I was in school in China. So I was studying abroad at the time, and um, I was just really, it started, I, I had really, I had problems sleeping, basically, so I had insomnia for a couple of months, and then I was very stressed and anxious. Um, and I just didn't want to be at that school anymore. And there was a day that I remember where I called my dad like 10 times being like, I think I need to come home with you. And then being like, no, actually I can stay and wait out, finish the term here. Um, and finally my dad was like, okay, I, I'm going to bring you back with me. Um, and so at the time I thought there was a psychological experiment, um, that was happening. And then I thought that my dad was involved as well. Um, with uh, psychiatrists and stuff like that and I thought they were trying to prove whether or not mental illness could be cured with placebos and the power of suggestion 
um, and I thought I was being studied. And so um, I thought it became this huge conspiracy, which I came up with basically, um, that the government was going to frame my entire family. The and Chinese that, government? What's that? The Chinese government or? Or no, no, like the, the Canadian government. Oh, okay. I see yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this was after, because it continued while I was back in Saskatoon. Gotcha. Okay. So at one point, I, I, one point I thought the, the Chinese government and Cana- uh, Canadian government were working together on this. Uh-huh. And then I thought that they were, um, and then at the time I saw on the news, Stephen Harper went to China. So I was like, mm. oh my God, he's going to China to talk about this. Mm. And I thought that um, they were tr- fighting over who gets the rights to this, like, um, to, like, if so this the experiment, research? yeah, to the research, if the experiment succeeded. Um, and then it turned out that it had failed and that I thought people were catching wind of the experiment and people were trying to figure out who was involved with it. And so I thought the government was going to fl- frame my entire family. And then I thought that all four of us had to die, basically. And so when I was in the mental, like in the hospital, I actually like accepted death. Like I, I came to terms with dying and knowing that it would be for the betterment of the world. And I thought that if I died, then at least the, there would be peace in the world. Mm. So when I was taking my medications and the first night I had really strong like medication because I was having trouble sleeping. So they gave me something really strong. Um, and it just knocked me right out. And um, I thought that when I was taking those pills that I was, my, my life was going to end, basically. Huh. Yeah, and then, um, and then I, the, the, what hurt the most and what was the fact that my whole family had to die. Mm-hmm. Coming to terms with that realization was very, um, made me really sad and just like, yeah, that was hard. So you said you're in the hospital. I went, so there must have been at a, a point where your parents were like, oh, this is not good. Yeah, you know, it was actually a friend of mine. My parents didn't know what was going on with me. They didn't know that I had, because I didn't really talk to them about my, what my thoughts were and stuff like that. Um, So my, a friend of mine um, at the time named Jace, uh, he was the one who I would like tell these things to. So I think he had a better understanding of where I was at compared to my parents. And so he actually came to my house one day from work because I, ha- I was on a phone call with him and um, I was asking him if he thought the world would be better without me and he thought I was going to commit suicide or something like that and so um, he rushed to my to my home and he told my mom that we should go to the hospital and so from then from there we went to the my family doctor and then my family doctor um, referred me to emergency uh-huh. yeah an emergency took you in yep yeah, and they took me in huh. Yeah, because uh, there's I know a bit lots of a wait, people but. that had lots of trouble getting into the hospital. Ah, uh, it was like you, know, you like I even I was take um, not taken in when I went to the ER one time. They basically said you have to attempt suicide really to even get into the hospital. But oh. but maybe because you weren't suicidal, you were. In psychosis, maybe it's yeah. Different well, they had they still had a security guard monitoring me when I was at the hospital in case oh. anything happened. So for the first like night and so until I got into the Dubai Center, then mm-hmm. I didn't have a security guard. But when I was when I was like um, just in the hospital, basically I, I had to wait for a room to open up oh, I because see. it was very full in the ward. Oh. Um, so I got in fairly quick, like the next day, basically. But. Oh, okay. um, but yeah, there was a security guard who would follow me and like take me to the washroom and wait outside the door and bring me back and stuff. So wow. cause, yeah, because my friend, I think, expressed to them that I might be suicidal. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. That's one thing I've been told many times is if you're going to a hospital, you almost have someone with you to advocate for you to really get the help you need. Right. But also I've heard that Saskatoon and Regina is very different with their mental health programming because there is the duvet center here and that right. they have some else now some kind of new kind of mental health er thing mm-hmm. <laughs> i don't know what it's called but yeah but the duvet family donated another million for, for that as well right so, um so that was 2014 all that happened? yeah that was 2014 in the spring in the springtime and were yeah. you on meds or anything like that yeah, prior to any of that oh no not prior to that oh, okay. just afterwards oh, okay yeah and you were diagnosed with 
it's like it just was, having psychosis? Yeah, at first it was just psychosis. And then I actually had a second episode um, just right before COVID happened. So I think that was 20, what have that been? 20, <laughs> when it's all a blur. Yeah. I think it was 2019. 2019? Yeah, 2019 seems right. Okay. It was when they, yeah, it was um, in the show Chicago. Do you remember what? That's when I saw you last. Yeah. Chicago. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, and that's when I saw you on Facebook say something about, yeah. about your mental health Yeah, and stuff. so it was during that time, basically. And I was working on this show, Unmasked. And I was just super emotional. I was in another contract as well. So I was kind of doing two, like rehearsing during the days and then at nights we would do workshopping and stuff. And there was a lot going on in my life. Um, and basically I like started, I thought celebrities were involved with this um, plan that we're gonna um, get, get me onto the voice, but not like this actual voice, the voice, not that actual show. It was like a different show. Um, and like I was texting celebrities and being like, hey, w when are you coming to Saskatoon? All this sort of stuff. Um, and I still kind of believe that there was like an experiment going on, which is weird because you think that after realizing and coming out of it, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, I would know that that's not true anymore. Right. But to res resort back to what I believed in the beginning, I thought that was very strange how the brain works that way. Yeah, yeah, so, for sure. Um, it wasn't as intense as the first time, but it was still kind of in the back of my mind there. And so, so this episode was there again, a friend or family member that yeah, kind of was I think like my family member really knew. I actually drove myself to the hospital because I I knew something was wrong and I just I needed to go to the hospital. And it's weird because I didn't know exactly what was going on. Like I thought there was, um, like I thought the nurses were actually people. Um, you know, uh, people involved with the experiment and stuff like that. And hmm. um, I thought that my case was um, basically after years, after years of, st I thought I was like, oh, maybe they were studying me still this whole time, but I just didn't know about it. Right. And now I'm actually realizing this time for sure that people are, are starting to find out, but everyone is wanting to know who this person is. And, um, and in a good way though, like instead of a bad way, if that right. makes any sense. So instead of them wanting to kill your family and you, it's something positive now. Instead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's well. something positive. So, um, but I was still like, clearly something was wrong. Um, and then I was diagnosed with bipolar oh, okay. um, type, I think type one. It's um, cause I you just- You don't know? <laughs> I, know, I know, I'm pretty sure it's type one. <laughs> Yeah, with the good I, kind. <laughs> I just um because I just experienced the manic episodes. I don't have the depressive episodes, so gotcha. it's just okay. just mania. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm pretty sure that's type one. Yeah. So is the psychosis um like a um, symptom of bipolar? I think so. Or is so. it a separate thing? No, I'm pretty sure it's a symptom of bipolar. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I you hear about uh, schizophrenia. Yeah. And and uh, being like super paranoid and, and kind of like the story you were telling about. Yeah. So what's the difference between uh, schizophrenia and being having psychosis? Like, is it is there a similarity like or is some, psychosis just yeah, a symptom of schizophrenia? <laughs> I feel like psychosis is also a symptom of schizophrenia as well. Okay. I think it's just like a generalized, you know, term right. used to describe someone who's being, who's, um, brain is processing information inaccurately right. and um, basically believing in like a fictional world and stuff like that. So I think that there's overlap between like that uh, bipolar and schizophrenia in that way. Oh, okay. Um, but um, yeah, I think there's other symptoms with schizophrenia that um, I don't have, which right. makes me not, which makes me have bipolar instead of the other. Schizophrenia, right. Okay. Yeah. And like, I don't know much about psychosis at all <laughs> but yeah. I'm pretty sure I, I had a psychotic episode once yeah and I don't know if if they can like your son like lasted for days or weeks coming yeah and going. when I like my, the day I had my suicide attempt this is like 10 years ago I too had like some narrative in my brain but it was only for maybe like a half an hour to an hour mm -hmm. and that's kind of what drove me to my suicide attempt so I don't so I, when I tell my story, I tell people I had a psychotic episode. 
mm-hmm. even though I don't really know if it was a psychotic episode yeah, or if I'm I sure was just uh, disassociating or I don't know what the difference is, but yeah, um, anyway. So yeah, w- when I saw the poster for your show and it said mm-hmm. uh, psychosis, I was like, okay, I really got a doctor because I don't know exactly what that is. Yeah. It's super interesting and yeah. So anyway, yeah. Um, and they at the time I remember my psychiatrist telling me that. Um, they didn't know what I had, basically, because um, he was saying how a lot of the times with schizophrenia and stuff like that, it's it's um, induced by having, um, like, being on drugs or something like that. And right. sometimes that can, you know, cause someone to have schizophrenia right. um, or, like, something like that. But I was, I basically, the only thing was, like, insomnia was the one, one thing that I had. And then plus anxiety and stress, which led to this. So they weren't sure of, like what what that was and stuff and so they just gave me told me that it was psychosis hmm. and that it was undetermined basically is what they said that was after your first that was after my first episode yeah okay. that I had and then after the second one they diagnosed you with the bipolar. bipolar yeah well it was actually the they never told me that I had bipolar even then <laughs> oh. it wasn't until like it was the psychiatrist that I saw um outside of the hospital like for, I had to go to him. Like a private um, session thing? Yeah, for a session basically. Oh, okay. And he was like, I think you have bipolar. Um, and then these are the meds that we're gonna give you to treat it and stuff. So I'm actually just getting weaned off my medication now. I've been on it for om- almost two years. And Why so- Why are you going off it? Um, because I, I'm feeling much better and- Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. I've heard that before. Oh yeah. Yeah, so they're, they're <laughs> saying, and the doctors were saying like, um, that I, when I was on it, to take it for like about a year and a half to two years, and then we can see see about um, weaning me off of it, and okay. then yeah. But if I have another episode, yeah, if I have another episode, then I'll probably stay on it for life. Right. So, I, same thing. I went off meds one time because I was like, I'm cured. I feel better now. And then it was, yeah, it didn't go so well. And right. I didn't, ha- you know, I was I was hyper diligent that like hyper like uh, focused on my every thought and everything right so it wasn't like (laughs) Like, Mm. I was super I was almost paranoid that I was going off my meds Mm. but I wanted to be off them so yeah the first kind of instances that I was like feeling down like I was super self-aware and so I I went back on them but and that's the thing yeah is that it's a really hyper aware like I, I felt like so hypersensitive and like really aware while I was going through this psychotic episode really you know like yeah it's like you're aware of everything and like your sensations and stuff like that like everything is heightened hmm. um, but it's weird that it you would it would feel that way I feel like because normally people would be like oh well maybe you're you're confused or like you don't really know what's going on at the time so your brain is not really clear on what it's doing but I remember everything about of that experience right but like your it's brain so clear was my saying mind. it was genuine and real your thoughts are justified and yeah huh because mm-hmm. when you said it was weird that kind of during your relapse yeah they started to believe stuff that you kind of stopped believing <laughs> yeah they were, um you know not true i i kind of okay it's a bit of a long story but i was on meds well i'm still on meds yeah and just recently well july 1st i lowered my meds okay. so again i was kind of i've been I don't know, kind of hyper focused and on my self awareness, and for a few days I wasn't, and I was kind of, I was going through withdrawal. Mm. I'm pretty sure it was withdrawal because it seemed, because when I went off my meds the first time, it felt just like that. So mm. once I recognized, oh, I'm having withdrawal. That's why I'm having suicidal thoughts again. I'm doing this and this and this again. Mm-hmm. Even though I knew that, it didn't make it any less real. It didn't make those feelings any less real. Right. Like, like you'd think, oh, I'm on, you know, I'm having withdrawal. Oh, I'm. That's why I'm feeling suicidal. So then you wouldn't feel suicidal anymore, or mm-hmm. you wouldn't feel sad anymore, or whatever. But it didn't. Right. It's like I know exactly what's wrong, but that it's still completely real. So I kind of relate to when you relapsed. How even though <laughs> you knew all those thoughts were were true, they still felt true. Yeah, and, totally. I don't know. It was a, Long yeah, story yeah, yeah. explanation, but <laughs> no, it was good. It was good. <laughs> so now, or actually, when you were write, writing the show, yeah, do you think some of that stuff triggered, like thinking about that stuff and writing about it, 
Do you think it maybe triggered your relapse yeah, a little bit? I don't know. I don't think it did. I feel like my my experience that I was having that kind of really brought it on was the um, the contract that I was doing at the time. Oh, okay. Um, I think that that space felt really like um, like not really collaborative, and it was just like mm. felt a little oppressive at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, feeling like I didn't have a voice, basically, in the project because we were devising a, a piece, so we were, we were doing like rewriting and stuff. Like basically, rewrote the whole play. Oh, okay. That, um, ex- you were just an actor, like you yeah, were, you we were, were part of like a involved. devising, a v- devising team. So it was gotcha. like myself and a few other actors, and then the director. And um, I think working on that play, I really felt like I couldn't contribute any ideas, and I was. I felt like um, I was um, there was no purpose for me being there and stuff, and feeling um, incapable to like write anything at the time and contribute to anything at the time. Mm-hmm. And I feel like a lot of those feelings um, caused a lot of the stress. And then it didn't help that I was also working on a mask as well. But I just remember being really sensitive in the room, like I would be reading scenes. Because originally at the time, I was still thinking of acting in it and being myself in the play. Um, and so uh, a lot of those scenes were really real. And it kind of like made me like really emotional mm-hmm. um, to do those scenes. Um, and so I, I don't think it helped, but I don't think it was the only reason why that I relapsed. Right. Okay. So I think it had more to do with the theater contract that I was working um, at the time. With, so, so you were under contract, like you can just piece out and be like yeah well luckily they were really they were really nice about that because they let me I told them that I was experiencing some mental health stuff and I need to take a break so they let me um leave basically okay. which was really nice because and usually apparently I was told later that if you choose to leave as an actor that you're supposed to pay 200 per week yeah you know mm. um to the company mm. um for leaving um but they didn't ask me for that so that was really nice of them Hmm, nice. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I've been, like, being a creative person. Yeah. It's it's tough being in a situation where you're trying to be collaborative and, like, yeah, and you're getting stonewalled or whatever, or you're getting, you know. Mm-hmm. Because it, it, being creative, it's, like, it's it's your whole reason of, for getting up some days, you know, is to, right. to create and do this project that you're passionate about and mm-hmm. then to be, like, yeah, to have that situation where you feel like, like why am I even doing this and then having I can like I've never been under contract like I've played in bands and stuff and mm-hmm. it's like ah I'm just quit. So, yeah, sorry guys I'm, <laughs> I'm leaving the band yeah. you know or whatever or I'm leaving I'm not gonna collaborate with you anymore because whatever reason mm-hmm. but yeah to have that feeling of a contract looming over you too that would yeah. that, so it's like you're you're yeah, that kind of that stuck feeling too. Yeah, yeah. that you're binded by contracts so you there's no escape kind of thing yeah 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 I, I, I feel for you. <laughs> Thank you. So now, oh, so how long did it take you to, to write Unmasked? Unmasked? Um, I think it was like on and off for about two years. Mm. Yeah. So I had a good good amount of time with it. Good. Yeah. And it's been running for two weeks now? Yeah, about a, a week and a half, I would say. Oh, okay. Yeah. Has every night sold out? So far, yeah. Really? Yeah, we sold out. We Damn added it. another show. Um, we added another show on Sunday evening. Okay. And then that sold in a day, or less than a day, actually. It was less than a day that Damn. the tickets sold out for that. So I think word is getting out. And I think that we did an article with the Star Phoenix, okay. which I think also helped. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I didn't even, I don't know what I was thinking, but we was... Maybe five days ago, we tried to get tickets and it was sold out. Yeah. Like, Holy shit. Like, well, maybe I'll go a night early on Friday. That was sold out. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. And anyway, I can't go Sunday because I have to be back. You have to be back, yeah. yeah. Damn it. Oh, I was feeling so bad. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Do it in Regina. Maybe, yeah. Well, nah, I guess it's not fun now with the mask stuff. <laughs> Yeah, we have. We're lucky. We have these clear masks for the actors. Oh, you did. Okay, good. Yeah, so that way we can still see their face, which is really good. And you don't even after a while you forget they're even there. So oh, good. That's been good. Yesterday was the first time that we wore them, or that they wore them. Right. Yeah. They had to. Yeah, they had to. Yeah. Exactly. So, 
Would you consider doing it in another city or something? Yeah, I totally would consider doing that in another city. Um, a lot of people have been talking to me about, about it, like people from the cast, people who have seen the show, and they're like, oh, you should tour it and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, that Is would it be a big cool. cast? Um, no, it's not very big. There's three actors and oh, one okay. musician. Oh, okay. Um, they go by Respectful Child. Right. Um, and so they've created a beautiful soundscape uh, for the show. Like, their music is just perfect. And um, it's, yeah, so it's been nice working with them and with a group of actors as well. So so it would be a fairly easy to show a tour then if it's... Yeah, like, the set not- pieces are all very mobile, um, and they're very minimalistic and mm. stuff. So I think it would be easy to... Um, pack it in a truck and then you know go go places but um, I might just want to take a little break from it right. and then focus <laughs> focus a bit on my my own acting and stuff like that right. um, and if and you're going off your meds you might want to be not on the road yes just exactly. to see what's, <laughs> what's right see, see how it goes for a while yeah exactly um, yeah how did you find the mental health system was it easy to navigate yeah um i found it quite difficult especially with the doctors Mm -hmm. and i just felt like i could never trust them and it wasn't until the psychosis it's part of the psychosis i think oh yeah yeah so i think that was that was tainted by that but um and it wasn't until i found um, a psychiatrist in north battleford who had worked with my brother because my brother's a doctor as well Oh, okay. And we went to get a second opinion, basically, after I was released from the hospital. And it turned out that um, I wasn't on high enough dosage. Mm. So that doctor put put me on a bit stronger medication. Nice. And um, he told, he explained to me what my brain was doing. He said it was like, like basically like a web. And you're just like grabbing thoughts and memory and pieces like that and putting it together into this web which cu- turns out to be a story, like a storyboard kind of thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, and... Um, and he, at the time, I forget now, but at the time he explained exactly what part of the brain um, does that and stuff. Um, and uh, the, th- like, the thought process, like the part of the brain that's associated with thought processing and stuff like that. Um, and uh, he was really friendly. Um, he uh, had a picture of his family on his desk and he told me about them. And he was just a really nice um, old man. So. <laughs> yeah. Did you find learning about the like the biology of what's happening in your brain helpful? Yeah, I thought it was it was interesting. It was very neat. I think it was good to find that out because to actually pinpoint and be like, oh, this is what's going on with me, right. and it helped understand like why I was feeling the way I was. Um, so I think that was really helpful. I yeah. think at the time, yeah. Good. When I was in, like I. It was an addiction treatment center for a while, and there's a few days where they kind of explain the, the, the biology in your brain, what happens with mm. addictions. And um, I just recently talked to another guest about anger, and yeah. he too explained the what happens biologically and what chemicals will release. And for some reason, yeah, I find that super helpful. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why. It's like, I think because when you're going through it, you can like, or when they're explaining the biology, you're like, oh yes, I remember an instance where you know I was at that moment where the chemical was then doing this and what, you know it's like and it, and it don't feel so alone maybe mm-hmm. because it's been researched so much that people know exactly what's happening yeah so I don't, I don't totally know. yeah okay good yeah totally huh. I, my emotions were up and down like they were so all over the place mm. um being through that experience it was like I remember one time um at my old house I was literally like screaming and like banging on the door of my bedroom downstairs, you know, like saying that I, I could harm myself, I could kill myself, you wouldn't know that, and like yelling that, wanting my parents to hear that. Mm. Because um, at the time, I think they didn't want me to go out with my friends because when I go out with my friends, we'd always drink and stuff at the time. And I wasn't supposed to do that with being on the meds and stuff. And so um, I was just yelling and screaming and shouting. I remember. And then I remember, like, coming upstairs and seeing my mom just crying and, like, you know, writing in her notebook while tears, like, drip down her face. Um, and I remember feeling, at the time, like, realizing that and being unable to empathize in right. that moment, you right. know? Yeah. And I think that's one of the scariest things is, like, when, when I'm doing that, it's like I don't, I, I'm not myself. You yeah. know, like I'm not, and 
and for them that's it's like I'm not their daughter like that's yeah. not how their daughter would be like you know Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde yeah exactly yeah that so. must have been well it must have been extremely scary for you thinking that people wanted to kill your family yeah and then on the other side it must have been extremely scary for them to hear to you banging on your door begging to take your life yeah 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 well, one of these days I'm gonna this is an episode I've been wanting to do for a long time is talking to family members family of members. someone who's on yeah. you know, the other side and totally because they're going through their own mental health yeah. situation and yeah. for my mom, she said that was like a nightmare. So putting on this play in the beginning was really, um, I wasn't sure how they were going to take it. My parents at times, they read, my dad read a few pages and he's like, oh, don't, don't do this. Like, mm. you know, they didn't want me to tell my story mm-hmm. um, because for them, it was such a horrible experience. And I right. think also there's still like that taboo in society, yeah. especially in Asian culture where like you don't talk about your mental health at all. Right. It's very taboo. You um, don't speak of it. It's just You're hidden. Asian? And- yes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just hidden under the rug, you know? Um, and so, yeah, so basically... They didn't want you to go through with yeah, it. Yeah, they didn't want me to go through with it. But then my mom saw the show, actually. She saw a dress rehearsal of the show because she wanted to come when there wasn't a lot of people. Just recently? Yeah, just recently, oh, okay. yeah. And she actually really liked it. So that was a huge surprise. It was a relief, really. Yeah. Um, Because I wasn't sure how she's going to take it because all my family members are in essentially like in the play. Right. Um, They're depicted in there. So um, she said that it was better than she expected. Was her words? (laughs) (laughs) Which is high praise in Asian culture. Yeah. 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 Yeah, That's good. Yeah. Um, Is it is it weird? Well, I mean, I guess you. You've been rehearsing, and I'm assuming you like workshopped it and all types of things. But yeah. the first few times it was weird seeing your story take place. Yeah, it was. Um, and you're like I, I guess, <laughs> Yeah, it was neat watching it because I could pick out. I'm like, oh, this. That's not how I feel like that piece should go, or like, that's not the the right feeling, or. Um, right, right. So I could like that was nice. It was really nice that way being able to assist and direct and be able to see those. P- problematic areas and like change them or shape them or you know um so you made it more how it actually was at that time yeah exactly gotcha. yeah, yeah, yeah 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 totally see i i've written a kid's book right so i saw that on facebook good <laughs> yeah. for you Thanks. so it's, That's it's awesome. basically you know my story as well but in a kid's book yeah and it's uh it's very different than seeing it played out night after night on stage right. you know with actual people and stuff yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's just like silly little well I shouldn't say silly but it's you know it's, it's a kid's book so yeah, I, I could awesome. imagine it like going even further and, and having it like a live action thing right. that I'm watching but yeah 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 because the kid's book enough it's kind of weird yeah and what's it it's daddy sometimes cries is that what it's called that's what everyone wants to say but it's sometimes daddy cries sometimes daddy cries oh okay <laughs> yeah, yeah. okay yeah actually I was just dropping off a bunch of books that the bookstore here in oh Tornigan, nice so, yeah. oh really cool that's yeah. awesome yeah thanks yeah it's, yeah yeah it's, it's a thing i guess I don't yeah know. that's awesome that's <laughs> so it took cool. you two years to write an entire play it took me four years to write a kid's book so. wow okay <laughs> yeah. like the same thing you know you come to it and then you leave it and then you come yeah, back and then you totally. leave it and then, yeah, and, and then you go back to the hospital, and then you come back to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you get sober, and then you come back to it. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I could speak a little bit about my experience in the Dubai Center. Yes. Um, perfect. I met a lot yeah, of there's people. There's anything you want to talk yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's. I met a lot of people when I was there because I was. I was basically like really wanting to make friends when I was there, and I was like super <laughs> like you know like down to just like meet people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I met um, three people. Um, there is uh, a this woman. Mean the play? They're actually based off of characters that, or like, there's characters in the story that are based off people I knew from the ward, gotcha. but they're very different, like personality-wise okay. and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Some of them are a little bit more similar, but others are are not uh, not so much. I oh, gotcha. Okay, um, sorry, cut you off. No, no, that's okay. Um, but yeah, I I wanted to make sure that I had them in the story because they helped me, you know, like. They would tell me about their own experiences. This one guy told me that he attempted suicide like three times and um, and now he's back in the hospital and he was saying like, you know, you have such 
a light you're just like glowing you know and you have such this pure light in you and he's like never let that go Hmm. and stuff like that and he was they were like there's two of them they're like brothers basically they felt like my brothers Hmm. and when I was in the ward and they would always like look after me and they would like make jokes and stuff and they made the time so much fun for me Hmm. um how long did you spend I was only there for a week oh okay yeah but even in that week like I just I didn't want to leave to be honest when my dad was like okay you're gonna be released for the hospital I was like I don't want to go yet you know mm-hmm. like i was i was love i loved meeting people and hearing about their stories and sharing mine and like mm-hmm. um there's just like a sense of togetherness and relatability mm-hmm. that i couldn't find with other people who hadn't experienced a mental illness right you know and that common ground like you know really connected us yeah i found yeah i found the same thing i was in the psych ward in regina for what two weeks and yeah there's you know a handful of people that i will never forget ever yeah. And a couple of them I, I had a five minute conversation with and that was mm-hmm. it. And I yeah. never saw them again because, well, the one lady was, I think it was my, f- the next morning mm-hmm. that I, I was just walked around, like the next morning that I was brought in there, mm-hmm. I had no idea what was going on. Like I was just walking around. I, I, mean, I, I can only imagine how I looked. Mm-hmm. And she was so, so sweet. And she's like, hi, how you doing? And like she... Almost didn't you're not allowed to touch each other stuff. She like she sat me down and we started working on a puzzle and she just talked and I was like, This is the sweetest lady I've ever met. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, and I, I talked to her for a little bit and then after about two days I never saw her again and I guess her she declined big time and she was suicidal mm. and she was there for uh postpartum depression. Right. And yeah, I guess she never left her room again the whole time that Dang. I was there and yeah. But that's just one person. Yeah. Like, there's many more stories too. Yeah, it's there was a, a lady that I also did a puzzle with as yeah. well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, she was uh, she's pregnant at the time. Really? Okay. Yeah, and so I think she had like um, PTSD or something like that. Hmm. Um, but uh, I had this awareness because I know she's having really hard time with the puzzle and stuff, and I could I I found myself being able to, you know, do it like do the puzzle and stuff and I I could tell that she was struggling Mm -hmm. and so I was like do you want to do something else and she's like no that's okay and so we still worked away at it and stuff but um, Mm. yeah it's funny I tell my story quite often Mm -hmm. but I I just talk about going to the hospital I never ever because I mean that's a whole other like two hour conference just my experience in the hospital and I've never actually sat down and got to that part of it right maybe I should someday try to yeah just journal it or whatever chalk it down yeah. so someday i don't forget because there's yeah there's a lot of wonderful people there yeah well i made a list of like little gifts that i wanted to give everyone you know and my dad saw me writing it and he's like what are you doing and i was like well i want to give gifts to these people after i leave the hospital and he's like no you don't need to like you're not going to see these people ever again and stuff like that and so i didn't end up doing it but mm-hmm. like i really wish i had mm-hmm. because they still really impacted me you know yeah. and for me like that that would be some like my dad wouldn't be able to know what that experience was like for me you know yeah because he yeah. didn't live that so yeah and even uh addiction treatment's the same way actually mm. it's because every you know everyone's in there for the same reason and you got all walks of life same with the psych ward it's yeah it's a cross section of society right all but they can all relate and bond with because of this you know common ailment or whatever yeah, yeah and it's, it's really special like i worked at the treatment center uh, that I went to two years mm. after I was sober and yeah. to see people do it again and with the staff and stuff it, it's really it is such a bonding experience yeah. because it is such a weird <laughs> goddamn thing that you right. go through mm-hmm. that yeah it's just I wouldn't change anything like yeah, I, I, I I learned so many life skills and so much about myself and other mm-hmm. people by going mm-hmm. to the psych ward yeah. And, and yeah anyway yeah totally so yeah, I'm actually really grateful for those moments. But yeah, same. Yeah. I remember what, sorry, now I'm just, now we're just hashing hospital stories. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was a lady that was, it was uh, walked around, she she always wore her winter coat and a fur coat over her winter coat, and I thought, this lady must be hot as hell. Yeah. And uh, there was a payphone, and she was always sitting around the payphone, and I don't even think she was even talking to anybody, and then she would like walk around, she's looking for quarters, and she, so the one day, I, I was like, 
I just gave I just handed her a quarter yeah because I knew she liked playing with the phone yeah <laughs> and her whole demeanor changed it was like it was like I gave her a brand new puppy or something like she was just like right. oh my god thank you so much now um, I can call my daughter and I don't think she even knows where I am and which I'm sure she was she did because yeah. she'd been there for days already and right but you know I don't I don't know what the hell's going on I don't know what's wrong with this lady so maybe your daughter didn't know I don't know but just changing her day just yeah. for that split second was just really wonderful with just then, a quarter and stuff yeah and then you know at meal time she'd sit down beside me and talk to me and yeah. tell me her story and it's, it's funny I don't know how many people I asked like so why are you in here yeah. I don't know how many people said I don't know <laughs> <laughs> oh really uh, <laughs> I don't know family drove me off like <laughs> so it's like uh, Weird. So I don't know. They must have had psychosis yeah. or something going on too. Yeah, yeah. Either they had no clue or they didn't remember. Right. But yeah. Yeah. I remember asking people, and usually people there that I spoke to knew kind of why they were there. Right. So they'd be like, "Oh, this is what I have, and you know, this is what I'm going through," kind of thing. So. Right. A bit yeah. more lucid. Right. Yeah. 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 Then there's the scary people. That yeah. Do. Like, yeah. There's well, a nurse sitting up the door of their the room and they're strapped in the bed just yelling all day long it's like yeah this place is well i didn't know they still had straight jackets but apparently yeah. they do yeah you know because um i was when i was in the ward i was asleep like the meds had me knocked out so like i just had a really good sleep so i didn't hear anything mm. but everyone else the next morning were talking about this one girl who just like kept on screaming and screaming and had to be like put in a straight jacket basically yeah. And um, I talked to that girl the next day, and she, her boyfriend came in and dropped off Dutch Blitz. It's like a card game, basically. Oh, okay. He dropped it off for her and stuff. And, um, she, yeah, she seemed fine and everything. But apparently the night before, she was just having a hard time there. Huh. Yeah. And so the nurses had to put a straitjacket on her. And I was like, I didn't know they still did that in mental institutions. But Yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Well, they still have electrical or electric shock therapy. Right. And I have a, a couple friends that are... I've gone through that, right. but they actually like, like put you under, like you you're you're asleep. Oh, okay. When they do it, so it's not like you're sitting there, you know, like you've right. seen the movies, like you're you're yeah. knocked right out and you just kind of come to. Yeah. You. Well, that's the other thing in movies which I hate because I feel like they depict people with mental illness always as the crazy person or like the villain or the psychopath who kills people. You never, I've I've never seen a movie where they depict someone like a truthful representation of someone who's living through something like that you know yeah yeah i'm sure there are but I i'm sure there are yeah they're not I, I've not, yeah, <laughs> yeah 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 or they're like yeah they're like some kind of villain they're super manipulative and yeah. they're likable but they're you know manipulative and shitty and yeah 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 i know the hospital's a weird place man yeah. i actually felt crazier in the hospital at times i was like because you're surrounded by so many other sick people. Right. And there were some times, there was a few times where a couple of the staff weren't so great and I was just like, what mm. the fuck am I doing here? Like, what is going on? Like, I, I felt like, yeah, I felt like I was going insane. Yeah. Um, one night I actually got in trouble and uh, it's a long story. I'll just go to the, <laughs> the results. <laughs> I ended up getting locked in my room they took my bed away, just threw a mattress on the floor. Really? And I was beside the nurse's station and in a room full of cameras. And they just locked the door and like... Wow. I guess I was misbehaving or something. And I was like, what the fuck? And that, that's the day that I really was just like... I, like, I think I had another psychotic episode. And it was, it was because of a bad staff member. Mm. And yeah, instead of... Um, and he was, a, he, he was a manager. So... I could tell everyone else under him were, was trying to de-escalate it, and he was making matters worse. And I could yeah. see the frustration in the other staff below him, but mm -hmm. because he was the manager or the boss at the time or on shift, there was nothing they could do. So, yeah, I got – he just sent me to the room and locked me in there and took my bed away. And That was like, that was like me when, during the second time I had a psychotic episode. They put me in a room with cameras, and it was just like a mattress that smelled like piss. Nice. And then it was just like, you know, that's where you're staying for the tonight kind of thing. 
Yeah. Um, I think it's, they didn't have room for me in the debate center or something. Okay. And I didn't end up actually going to the debate center that whole entire week. They just had me on surveillance and like on the emergency room. And it was for me, it was really like also really hard to see people in yeah. emergency because they're usually people who are like a bit more like but more stuff is going on with them like they're they might not be in the best shape and stuff like that yeah and so that was kind of traumatic just kind of seeing people while i was in this hyper state of reality and like yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's scary yeah um i don't miss it <laughs> yeah same <laughs> yeah yeah and, and at the same time i find it hard to accept because that's another reason why I want to lower my meds. It's like, I'm feeling good. And it's like, when I went off my meds completely, I did it with my doctor when we we worked together. This was a few years ago. And a friend of mine ran into me a couple months after I was off my meds and she could see I wasn't doing well. Mm -hmm. And I I just said, yeah, I'm not doing good. And she's like, well, go back on your meds. And I was like, oh, but you know, I had to fight really hard to get through the withdrawals. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was almost like, well, I'm I've gone this far. I don't want to go back again. I fought this hard to get right. off the withdrawals and all this stuff. And she just kind of, hold, kind of grabbed my, held my arm gently. And was like, you know, I have high blood pressure. And my blood pressure is good. I do the same thing. I go off my beds because I think it's fine. And every time I end up in the hospital, I've just accepted that I have blood pressure, high blood pressure, and I need meds. Mm-hmm. It's okay, Todd. Yeah. It's okay to be on your meds. And it was like I just started bawling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And just the way she did it, and the way, what she said, it was just like the sweetest thing. It was exactly what I needed to hear at the time. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the next day, pretty much, I started going back on my meds. And nice. So anyway, um, mm-hmm. that being said, I still have a hard time accepting it. And of mm-hmm. course, I always want to be cured. So this summer, you know, I asked with my doctor, can we lower my meds? And we, we've been doing it. Yeah. But I don't know if you feel this way, but sometimes I feel like less of a person because I have to be on meds, or it's like mm-hmm. I'm less... Um, I feel inadequate maybe or something mm. I don't know if you ever get that feeling that because you have a mental health issue mm. I, I almost feel like I, I wouldn't have that problem if I had like diabetes or MS or something you mm. know because it's just so easy I take a blood test and this right. is okay I have to do this with my meds or whatever and it's a physical thing but mm-hmm. because it's a mental thing it's harder to pinpoint and yeah and it's harder to hard. accept because right. there's you know I don't know do you ever get that? No, not really. I don't no. think so. Yeah. Damn. I feel like it's... Damn it! <laughs> yeah. Um, it's just something that I know I have and, like, that's part of part of me. Um, You're cool with it, right? From the get-go. Yeah. I feel okay with it, you know? I feel, I feel okay. Like, it'll be interesting to get off meds and see what that's like, you know, because I've been on them for so long, so who yeah. knows what might happen. All, all your but, meds? Yeah, slowly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So mm. um, I'm getting weaned off. First, I'm getting just weaned off the olanzapine, I think, um, and off the mood stabilizer. Um, so I'm getting off that, and then and then I think we'll get weaned off the lithium. So. Uh, on lithium. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, is it a high dose? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think it's very high. Yeah, I have I a friend that was actually getting lithium poisoning because he was on oh, such a really? high dose. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, my brother kept on telling me to get my blood work done to always check to make sure that it's, you know, fine. But, yeah. Mm. You were saying your parents kind of didn't want you to do the show at first. Yeah. I remember when I went into the hospital in Indian Head, um, I was kind of, I was feeling suicidal. And this is the night that I, the last time I drank and I got sober because of this, I had my wife take pictures of me and post it because I was already doing some mental health advocating. Mm. And uh, my parents kind of questioned me too. It's like, why are you taking pictures of yourself in the hospital and posting this stuff? Like, right. you know, I was like, and then, you know, it took a few months. And then my mom was like, I get it now. And it's, it's I think it's really cool that mm-hmm. you're doing it because I don't I just want to normalize it. Yeah, totally. Like if I hide it, then it's, I'm, I'm doing no one favors. <laughs> like yeah. you're just, perpetuating the stigma and exactly. making it worse for others exactly yeah and that's kind of why i wrote this play too you know is for people who haven't experienced mental illness to know what it feels like to live through something like that yeah. and for people who have to to feel a sense of connection and relatability to give those people a voice you know
Thank you again, Megan. That was awesome catching up with you, uh, having you tell me about your experience, and hopefully uh, others can learn from that and, uh, you know, maybe relate to it. And, and yeah, yeah, just thank you so much for that. Next episode, I talk to the Johnson family. I speak to the son, Teague. He is 21, I believe, and he has autism. I talk to him about some of the challenges he has uh, mental health wise and uh, mental illness wise with uh, the challenges of having uh, autism and I speak to his parents Garth and Catherine about well about Teague's uh, struggles with mental health but also some of their own uh, maybe traumas and things that they had to deal with uh, uh, raising someone with autism uh, it's a great episode it's great that an entire family was able to be vulnerable and open up to me and to speak about this so uh they are a great family i'll give you more details about them in the intro for that episode uh and in the meantime you know have a have a great weekend have a great week and i'll see you soon thank you for listening and please subscribe rate and review however you are listening to this podcast it only takes a moment and it really helps the show out with getting noticed This episode has been sponsored by Penny University Bookstore, 3104 13th Avenue. Call 639-571-2186 and check out their online bookstore at pennyu.ca. The Saskatchewan Podcast Network is supported by Conexus. Wellness, however you define it, is achievable. You don't even need to figure it all out by yourself. Talk to Conexus. They'll give you guidance, motivation, and the push you need to reach your goals. They've got you. They're your financial partner and they know you can achieve your very best, your financial best. Prove them right. Start right at Conexus Credit Union. The Saskatchewan Podcast Network is also sponsored by Direct West. Are you a business owner looking for new avenues to promote your business? Direct West digital billboards are a great opportunity to highlight a new product, new promotion, or anything else you'd like your customers to know about. You can get local expert marketing help for your business at directwest.com. If you are having a mental health crisis, please call the Canadian Crisis Number at 1-833-456-4566. In Saskatchewan, the mobile crisis team in Prince Albert is 306-764-1011. In Regina, it's 306-525-5333. And in Saskatoon, it's 306-933-6200. Don't forget to check out my children's book, Sometimes Daddy Cries. Sometimes Daddy Cries is told through the eyes of a boy whose father suffers from depression. He sees his dad get sad, rest, and even go to the hospital, all while comparing his father's depression to a physical ailment. Available on Amazon.ca. I'll see you next time. This is Todd Redebaum saying, make your beds, take your meds. Bye.